from the St. Francis Yacht Club in San Francisco, this is the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, hosted by Ron Young. Welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, live from the virtual grow room of the St. Francis Yacht Club. Everybody who's been on the water for any length of time notices that every now and then there are algae or scientifically algal blooms on the water. Sometimes they look red, sometimes they look orange. So they look all kinds of different colors. Groups of fish die off in, in algae blooms. You know, we have been wondering about this for a while. Lisa Krimsky is a PhD and water resources regional specialized agent for the Southeastern District at the University of Florida. She basically watches over the eastern shoreline at the southern tip of Florida. Lisa, welcome to Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. We want to know all about algae or algal blooms, what causes them, and what effect do they have on aqua life, and what would it be like if you go swimming in those waters? Give us the lowdown. Hey, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm excited to be presenting to you all today, and today I'm going to be talking about a specific type of algal bloom. Um, that caused by an algae called sargassum, and it is now known to be the world's largest harmful algal bloom. So since we are talking about algae, I need to give a little bit of an introduction for you all, just to start at the basics of what is algae. And so when we talk about algae, we're talking about a type of aquatic plant-like organism, but they're not true plants that we think of like those that are growing in our yards or in our gardens because they don't have many of the true defining features of plants such as true roots or leaves. And algae are extremely diverse. So they can include a group of unicellular or single celled organisms that we refer to as phytoplankton. These are ones that you need a microscope to be able to see in the water and are primarily moved around by currents. And they can also include those really large multicellular seaweeds or what we refer to as macroalgae. Most of these seaweeds are found attached to the bottom of the ocean, like those giant sea kelp forests. Um, and because, again, they're not true plants, they don't have those roots that we were talking about. They're attached to the bottom through what we call holdfasts, and they're attached to rocks and other hard surfaces. But algae are primarily aquatic, meaning that they're constrained to water, but they can be found in almost any water ecosystem there. So oceans, lakes, rivers, ponds, they can even be in puddles in your yards. But essentially, because they are photosynthesizing organisms, they need sunlight to grow. And so that means that generally, wherever there's water, they're going to be at the surface where there's enough sunlight for them to generate photosynthesis. Today, we're talking about sargassum. Sargassum is a type of algae, and it's considered to be a brown macroalgae. So meaning it is one of those seaweed types of algae. There's a couple hundred types of sargassum found throughout both the temperate and tropical oceans. Most of them are found attached to the bottom. They're called benthic, but of all those hundreds of species, there are only two species that are found entirely free floating throughout their life. That's Sargassum natans here on the top left and Sargassum flutans on the top right. So any of you who, who like trivia, these are the only two free floating Sargassum species in the world and they're found in the Caribbean. They grow sort of like, I mean, they're individual, but they grow into large mats. And so that's kind of what we're talking about today is that the largest mat is now spans thousands of miles across the entire tropical Atlantic. So these two sargassum species flow at or near the surface where it can accumulate into either these large mats or windrows, which you can see in this bottom right hand corner, and then they're dispersed with the currents. Sargassum is the namesake for the Sargasso Sea. This is off the Atlantic coast, and it's the only sea in the entire world that doesn't have any land boundaries. Its boundaries are defined by the surrounding currents. And for this reason, Sargassum, the algae, becomes this mid-ocean refuge for migratory species in the middle of the ocean. It's a crossroads for those Atlantic species to come feed, spawn, provide protection amongst those mats 
before they continue their migration route. So as you see here in this bottom left-hand corner, this is a sargassum mat that's providing habitat for a variety of fish species. And if any of you are anglers and really like to go fishing out in the Caribbean, you know that your best chances of finding the large catch, those tuna, those mahi, sometimes those sailfish, are going to be near those large sargassum mats because they're such a hot spot for species in the middle of the ocean. Because of this, sargassum mats have been called the golden floating rainforests. And scientists have recognized more than 100 species of fish, more than 145 species of invertebrates. You have large marine mammals such as whales and dolphins, sea turtles, and birds that use these mats for breeding nursery and a feeding environment. In addition to being beneficial for biodiversity, sargassum mats are also extraordinarily important for carbon sequestration, which is something that we're really concerned about now. So they are photosynthesizing organisms, which means that they take carbon out of the atmosphere and convert it into usable oxygen. But they also are stores of carbon. And so when these large mats of algae die, it sinks and takes all that carbon with it and essentially traps that into the deep ocean. So extremely important in terms of carbon sequestration and removing that out of the atmosphere and trapping it into the deep ocean. Once the winds and the currents bring this floating sargassum onto shore and it gets beached, it's also beneficial because it becomes a food source for those organisms that are found at the rack line, those birds and crabs and other crustaceans that you see picking if you've ever been on the beach and walk the rack line and you see the, the algae and you see all these organisms sort of picking and feeding. Sargassum is an extremely important source of food in that normally very deplete environment. Because all of these benefits, it's been recognized by the United States as essential fish habitat in the open ocean. It's recognized by the International Commission for the Conservation of Atlantic Tunas. And it's also been the Sargasso Sea Alliance was created specifically for the protection and management of sargassum in the Sargasso Sea. So when we talk about management and protection of natural resources, oftentimes scientists and resource managers will try and put a monetary value to the services that they provide to humans. And so this image that you're seeing was created by World Wildlife Fund in 2010 to calculate the economic ser ecosystem services provided by sargassum within the Sargasso Sea. And essentially what I want to point out here is that the variety of services that we discussed in the prior slide amounts to 2.8 billion dollars in ecosystem services. And what may be surprising is that the majority of that is in nutrient cycling and water purification and waste management. So what that means is that sargassum within the cells of its tissue, it actually has a special polysaccharide that can take and filter out negative things from the water and helps to purify it and clean it, which is one of the reasons why the Sargasso Sea is recognized and protected. So when we talk about sargassum in the open ocean, we often refer to it as golden tides because of this beautiful golden color of the seaweed that we see in these mats and in the windrows. And these are not new. Christopher Columbus is credited with the first written account of sargassum on his voyage in 1492. There's verified records of sargassum being beached in Galveston, Texas, back in the 1800s. And sargassum, although not by name, but it's actually recognized in 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, which is written in the late 1800s. So it's not new, and it's always been an important part of the environment and the ecosystem. What is new is this massive influx of sargassum that gets beached onto shore, this has started to occur in 2011 and has been occurring near annually ever since. And these are called brown tides because once it's beached on shore, the decomposition of the beach sargassum changes from that golden color to this brown color. And this is when they become a nuisance or harmful. And so it's important to distinguish between the beneficial protective golden sargassum tides in the open ocean and the 
harmful algal blooms that occur when they get washed on mass. So we're using the term algal bloom, and I need to define what that means. So an algal bloom is essentially the rapid and substantial increase in algae biomass in an aquatic system. And this is a natural occurrence. You can have a large amount of algal biomass and it's just part of the natural system. It doesn't necessarily mean it's bad or that it's harmful. However, an algal bloom can become harmful when it produces either toxic or harmful effects to human health or aquatic ecosystems. So for example, you all, these inset pictures, these are pictures of red tides off of the coast of California, which you might be familiar with. These are common harmful algal blooms that you see off of your coast. The sargassum brown tide is now considered an algal bloom and a harmful one, not because it produces toxins, but because once it gets washed on shore, it has a lot of these negative impacts, both to human health and the ecosystem. Harmful algal blooms or HABs in short, they can be planktonic, meaning they can be microscopic, such as the red tides that you have in California, or they can be attached to the bottom. They can be phytoplankton, which is microscopic, or they can be these large macroalgal seaweeds like sargassum that we're referring to, and they can be toxic or they may not be toxic. So it's extremely complicated and there's an extremely diverse array of harmful algal blooms, which really provides a challenge when you're trying to manage them. But generally speaking, all harmful algal blooms have four main factors that determine their growth. Sunlight, because they're photosynthetic plants, so they need more light, which promotes faster growth. Nutrients, again, they're plants, they need that food source. So higher sources of nutrients means more algal biomass. Temperature, generally speaking, warmer tem temperatures promote faster growth. And time, so if a bloom is that accumulation of algae, you need time for that algae to actually accumulate, which is why you rarely see algal blooms in fast moving rivers because it gets flushed out of that system. And so blooms are natural, but if you're seeing persistent blooms, it's an indicator that something's not quite right in the system. What causes algal blooms? And this complex chemical, physical, and biological factors. And each of these factors are gonna differ depending on the location, um, the type of water body, the type of algae that we're talking about. But generally speaking, it's going to be factors that are going to influence that water, um, the sunlight, the water temperature, the nutrients, and that time. And so ultimately, when those growth factors are greater than those loss factors, you're going to have a bloom. And that's the case with these sargassum inundations that we now experience. So I'm going to shift focus now and talk about how these blooms have suddenly started to occur. And what you can see here on that top image is a graph that shows the coverage in kilometers of sargassum in the Caribbean Sea and Central Atlantic Ocean. And so what you can see is that starting in 2011, basically the larger that bar, the more coverage it is. So it's just been expanding expanding and continues to expand since 2011. It is now considered to be the world's largest macroalgal bloom, and it actually covers more than 5,500 miles from the Gulf of Mexico in the United States across the entire Central Atlantic Ocean now to Western Africa. And it's been estimated that all that algal biomass taken together is more than 20 million tons of algae across the entire Atlantic Ocean. And it's been a near annual event since 2011. And so growth is triggered by these new seed populations, which I'll talk about in a little bit, an increase in nutrients, which is that food source, and then these strange climatic anomalies that are influencing that temperature, light, and more specifically that time factor. Generally, this was the, the historic oversimplified version of how sargassum moved and was constrained in this region. So you have the sargasso sea, and sargassum would be transported through the passes in the northern Caribbean following those blue arrows. The swift current of the Caribbean Sea would then sweep 
that sargassum towards the Gulf of Mexico through the Yucatan Straits. And then every once in a while, you'd have this gyre, which would let some of that sargassum flow out and it would get beached onto you know, the coast of Texas or into North Mexico. And the rest of that would essentially return via the Gulf Stream. Some of it may get beached on the Atlantic coast, which is what I'm familiar with here in South Florida, but it would essentially get retrained back into the Sargasso Sea, terminating its voyage and starting that cycle all over again. In 2011, um, we saw this weird anomalous shift where suddenly for the first time ever, we were seeing Sargassum across this entire um, North Atlantic, the, the Caribbean Sea and the, and the Central Atlantic Ocean and off of the coast of Gibraltar and Africa. What I want you to focus on first is this inset here, which is the North Atlantic Oscillation. And essentially, this is a period of sea level pressure, and it's the variation in this North Atlantic Oscillation is going to drive the location of the jet stream, which in turn then drives changes in wind and ocean currents over the entire North Atlantic Ocean. So a positive shift or what you see here and going up in red will shift that jet stream and the currents northward, whereas a negative shift in blue will shift those currents southwards. And what I want you to notice is in 2010, this huge negative shift, meaning that that jet stream got pushed southward to an anomalous degree. What scientists believe occurred is that due to that shift, winds that typically blow to the east strengthened and actually shifted south, pushing sargassum out of the Sargasso Sea and across the Eastern Atlantic towards West Africa. Sargassum arrives off of Gibraltar and those anomalous eastward currents and winds defined a new temporary pathway for sargassum to move eastward and join the Canary Current. That sargassum, that algae, is then advected southwest into the North Equatorial Current and spreads into the tropical Atlantic and Caribbean. And you can see here, essentially, this red circle here is this new flourishing mat of sargassum that aggregates due to wind convergence under the intertropical convergence zone, which is an area of strong easterly trade winds that accumulate sargassum. So what we have now is a new sargassum regime, a new seed population underneath this intertropical convergence zone that's responsible for providing new sources of sargassum to this larger Caribbean region. If we remember going back to what causes a bloom, we have a couple growth factors. We have sunlight. Well, we're talking about the equatorial region. So we have a lot of sun, a lot of light intensity. We also have a lot of warm water. This is sort of this perfect opportunity for algae to take advantage of those optimal photosynthesizing factors. We also have time. You might think, how is it possible that in the open ocean you have time? Well, because of these, this constrained area of the intertropical convergence zone, you now have an area of winds and currents that are essentially trapping sargassum into this new region. And lastly, nutrients. This zone can actually move depending on um, the strength and direction of winds. And so in different times of the year, you get nutrients from the equatorial upwelling zone. During the winter, it can actually move closer and take advantage of nutrients from the Amazon River and the Orinoco River, and then also from the Northwest Africa upwelling zone. So you have all four key growth factors now supporting this continued bloom. When we're talking about 
sargassum being a new global harmful algal bloom, just a reminder, it becomes harmful and impactful once it's beached on shore, not when it's in the open ocean, where it's still beneficial for those migratory species and is still a food source and a place where those animals can meet to spawn. But once it's washed on shore, as you can see in this top left picture here, becomes a massive burden. You're talking about thousands of tons of decaying algae washing ashore. And most of these are island nations in the Caribbean. So the first thing that they have to contend with is actual disposal. What do they do with all of this algae biomass and how do they get rid of it? And where do they dispose it in a place where space is often limited and in constraints? And it's been estimated that it would take at least $120 million to clean up Caribbean sargassum inundations annually. So the cleanup really has to be prioritized and can only occur in those areas that are deemed essential for the tourism industry. And so once you do clean it up and once you prioritize, then again, you have to figure out how do you actually manu manually transport it to these places and then what do you do with it? The next impacts that we're discussing are those ecosystem health impacts. This is a healthy seagrass bed right off of the coast and what happened to it after a sargassum inundation. Essentially, once the sargassum washes on shore, the decaying sargassum results in increases in turbidity, brown murky waters, it decay reduces light, pH, and oxygen, which can impact all of those healthy ecosystems that we want that are currently existing in the bottom. Due to the loss of light, those increased temperatures, seagrass meadows lost about 61 to 99.5 percent of their below ground biomass and were eventually replaced by these less beneficial calcareous algaes. And all nearshore corals either suffered partial or total mortality, and this occurred in Mexico. Other ecosystem impacts, if you recall, we talked about how beneficial sargassum is in the open ocean in terms of uh, nutrient remediation and, and water clarity. However, once that degrades, what that means is that all of those beneficial things that was removing from the water actually get re-released. And so you can see in this bottom left how turbid that water is. And so you're releasing all of that stored heavy metals, those nutrients. And it's been estimated that um, during peak sargassum influx, the monthly nitrogen influx to coastal waters was more than from all land-based sources during an entire year. So due to these pulsed huge blooms of sargassum that are washing up, you're getting huge impacts in terms of nutrients in a nearshore region, which regularly should be very low in nutrients, really crystal clear blue waters. And so you're seeing a lot of impacts to that. In terms of um, the social, cultural, and human health impacts, the de degradation of sargassum actually re uh, releases hydrogen sulfide. This negatively impacts air quality, results in unpleasant odors, and prolonged exposure is unhealthy. Um, there have been reports of respiratory problems, nausea, headaches, and irritation. And because you have to prioritize where sargassum is being removed, it's usually the local populations that are really experiencing these human health impacts more than the tourists themselves. You also have those impacts to aesthetics and access to near shore waters, which is particularly impactful to the fisheries, aquaculture, and maritime communities. So you can imagine just from this picture here, the challenge with entanglements, both in terms of the actual boat itself and the fishing gear itself, try pulling a trap in that through, you know, hundreds of of pounds of sargassum. It gets trapped amongst boat props and is impossible to get out. There's been notification from the yachting community that ships and boats find it difficult to navigate through these thick mats of sargassum. It affects the engines and slows down the speed of sailing. Sargassum will get snagged on rudders and keels, creating drag. 
again, getting clogged in those engines and wrapped around props. So it becomes a major challenge just for navigation. And then lastly, you can imagine, you know, the tourism impacts. Tourism in the Caribbean region contributes more than 80% of that region's GDP. It's worth approximately $29 billion, but no one wants to take their vacation on a beach that's covered with dead, rotting, sulfurous sargassum. So it's had a huge hit to the tourism industry over the last decade. So what can we do about it? Let's talk monitoring management and is there a way to monetize this sargassum? So the first line of defense and the best tool that we currently have in our tool belt right now is mitigation through forecasting. This is an example of forecasted maps that are produced by the University of South Florida, their sargassum watch system. It's all satellite based. And what I'm basically showing you here is how their impacts um, are dependent on wind and currents. So over months and over years, sargassum is going to change. And so you, it's important to be able to predict how and where sargassum is going to be impacting these communities so that they can plan ahead as to where they should be focusing their efforts. Even with these amazing, amazing maps, which have been really useful to the communities in order to prioritize their resources, there's limited satellite coverage, low spatial and temporal resolution. So when you're trying to make decisions at a beach or resort level and you don't have the spatial or temporal scale to be able to make those real-time decisions. And then there's also biological unknowns. So what's happening in the field? How do you actually correlate that with what you're seeing from a satellite image? So this has been an amazing tool for these communities, but we need more tools in the toolbox. And so in the images, red means lots and lots of algal bloom, green yep. means algal bloom, and blue means less algal bloom. And so well, the dark blue is ocean. So right. the dark blue is is pure ocean. Yeah, and the, the warmer colors are more algae. The cooler colors are less algae. So you can see, for example, 2018 was one of the worst years on record, as was 2022. You can just tell by that red hot spot how much algae was actually out there. Whereas comparatively, 27 wasn't that bad. Um, I also showed this graph because July is often the peak year. So you can see that even in years where maybe the algal bloom isn't as bad as it has been, July is always a bad year. Whereas you tend to start to get relief once you get into the fall and winter months, as you can see. So in terms of management, once these inundations do come on shore, what tools do we have? What options do we have for managing these sargassum inundations? We're going to work sort of from top left to right. So there's a couple options. If the sargassum is limited, remember, sargassum is part of the natural environment, just not in the mass amount that we're seeing now. So if you're seeing it in limited numbers, you want to leave it alone. You want to make sure that you're maintaining this as a food source, that you're maintaining this as a shoreline stabilization, as a fertilizer source. So in opportunities where you see it like this, it might not be ideal for tourists, but you want to leave it alone. And then it's essential to prioritize which species which will be cleaned and which will be left in this natural state. In areas that where you have deep beaches and a dune system, you can actually bury it too. So for small amounts of sargassum, burying it can be part of the solution. And again, it can create more of that shoreline stabilization by adding carbon to a system and allowing it to, to build up rather than degrade. Manual removal is preferable, but you can imagine when you're talking about thousands of tons that it becomes very limited and location prioritization really becomes important here. There is um, mechanized removal, which you can see here. The challenges with that is that a lot of times you're gonna have permitting issues. You're also gonna have beach access issues. Mechanical removal will also remove the sand and contribute to beach erosion. And then you need to be careful to nesting wildlife. Oftentimes the peak um, inundation months are also peak sea turtle nesting season. So you have to be care of sea turtles and other nesting birds. There are some innovative solutions for trying to actually remove it 
out in the water before it actually comes on shore. This is very preferable, but again, permitting is required in some locations. And then lastly, in those areas, especially tourist areas where people still want access to the beach for recreation, um, outwater booms are becoming um, a tool in the toolbox to be able to maybe not prevent the sargassum completely, but minimize how much of it is being washed on shore. Lastly, people are really looking at value-added solutions. So being able to valorize or monetize sargassum. When you have massive amounts of biomass or a product, there has to be something that you can do in a beneficial way to be able to maybe make use of that product. And we already discussed the many benefits that sargassum provides in the natural environment, especially in terms of that purification, nutrient remediation world. So is there an opportunity to utilize some of those natural benefits for a market value. And what it's actually funny in doing my research on this, I came across this 1960 Walt Disney Donald Duck publication called Secrets of the Sargasso Sea. And so in this story, Donald and Scrooge and the, the nephews, these ducks are actually having their adventure based off of the fact that Scrooge is trying to start a seaweed farm in the Sargasso Sea and make money off of its benefits. So you can see that the benefits of Sargassum, sort of joking aside, have been recognized for a long time. And on this um, side here, I want to just show you that all of the various products that are currently can be or are considered to be made by um, sargassum algae. And so this group essentially were able to calculate with one ton of fresh sargassum, how much of a product are you going to be able to get? And so you can see everything from energy to fertilizer to um, clothing and shoes notebooks, paper products. This is a huge and exciting opportunity. And there's a lot of businesses that are focusing around the valorization of this product because there is just so much biomass. But there's a lot of challenges to this constraint. First and foremost, that unpredictability of supply, as you saw from those maps, the satellite maps that I showed previously, every year is different and every month is different. So try starting a business not knowing what your startup supply is ever going to be. It's really hard to be able to predict what your product scale can be when you don't know what your supply is. In terms of the chemical composition of seaweed, this is especially important when you're talking about using the algae in terms of feed products or nutrient supplements or even as like a compost material. Because that algae is so good at removing elements and heavy metals and stuff from the water, all that product is still there when the sargassum decays. So you have to do chemical composition tests for things like arsenic, heavy metals, cadmium, to make sure that they're meeting international safety standards. Harvest, transport, and storage. How do you get it from this open beach environment to a more formal business factory type of setting, all of the logistics around that. Governance and funding are probably two of the biggies. Remember that this is a fairly new harmful algal bloom. This only started in 2011. Um, so it's really only been more than a decade that we've just been trying to figure out the nuances of this harmful algal bloom and how to deal with it. So all of these industries that are trying to take advantage of this product are really new. And so they're trying to deal with a system that doesn't have a formal government for how do you deal with permitting, removal, something that is protected in the open ocean, and support and funding to promote that. So there's a lot of opportunities. Fortunately, sargassum is a product that has a lot of natural benefits and really can be used in a variety of ways, but we have to overcome some of those challenges um, which have been identified in this wheel um, if we're really ever going to make serious progress in terms of being able to transition a harmful algal product into a beneficial um, monetization. 
So that's it. I'd um, like to thank you for taking the time to learn about this new challenge. And hopefully um, when you're out there yachting in the Caribbean, you'll be more, <laughs> a little bit more informed as to what it is that you're looking at. And hopefully you won't get stuck in a mat of sargassum um, and that we can find a solution to some of these you know, global challenges that we're now seeing with these sargassum blooms. Wow, Lisa. Holy moly, a whole world of information about sargasm. Sure, give me some summary. Are we in danger of being overwhelmed by it? Or are we on the threshold of learning how to monetize it? What's the condition of sargasm in the world? Yeah, I think, so we are already um, becoming inundated with it. And by we, I mean primarily the larger Caribbean region. And there are areas that have never experienced this before and are now trying to handle this massive influx of, of dead and decaying seaweed. So it's an issue and there's no indication that it's gonna be going away anytime soon. So we are now at the stage of trying to figure out how best can we monitor it, forecast it, predict it so that we can become better at living with it. And hopefully part of living with it means getting rid of it and making it, turning it into something that's more valuable. What's the overall space this covers? Is this a hundred square miles, a thousand square miles? You said the longest blooms of this go for thousands of miles. Are they actually connected for thousands of miles or are they just patches of it for thousands? No, of it's, miles? it's patches. And, you know, think about, again, when you're out on the boat, you all the, the winds and the current and how it moves things around. It's not a continuous, it's not like a swimming pool where it's a stagnant, uh, you know, plot of water. It's this constantly moving water body that's at the mercy of winds and surface currents and larger currents. So it's always moving and shifting and, and pulled apart in larger clumps and smaller clumps, but, and that's constantly moving. So that's also part of the, the challenge with, the using um, monitoring and satellites is it's a snapshot in time when really this is an ever-changing experience. So now why is it there sargasm in the Pacific Ocean or in the South Pacific? There are different species of sargassum in the Pacific and the South Pacific. And most of those are the ones that are attached to the bottom that we think of that more traditional seaweed that you know are stuck there on the bottom. Right. The two that we have in the Caribbean here that we're discussing, these are the only two sargassum species that happen to be free floating um, throughout their entire life cycle. And that's just where they're found. They're, they're not found in the Pacific. So you and I know that there are clams in San Francisco Bay that didn't come from San Francisco. Bilgewater from Southeast Asia expelled in San Francisco Bay have you know, have transported those organisms from Southeast Asia to San Francisco, where they're growing now. And that's not happening with, with these products. These don't get bred to other areas outside the Caribbean. They just grow in the Caribbean, it sounds like. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly possible. Invasive species is one of the biggest challenges that we have as a nation of, you know, species that are transported from one place to another. San Francisco Bay is the perfect case study of that. Whether or not it's been moved, you know, such like stuck on a prop or something of a boat and it's just never established. I think the fact that you are dealing with such large bodies of water, you need to have the ideal situation in order for it to survive and thrive. And so when you're talking about light and temperature and salinity tolerances, it, it, um, the Pacific region maybe just doesn't have that exact criteria. Who else cares about this? You guys care about it because you got water resources as an issue. Are there other parts uh, of the government that care about this? Other parts of, you know, does the Coast Guard care about this? Who else cares? Oh, I, <laughs> basically any anyone who touches the water cares about this. This has become one of the biggest issues, different facets of government and industry. So, you know, as we mentioned from the tourism standpoint, um, it's become a, a major nightmare because every time you see these blooms, it gets popped up on he news headlines and then people don't want to come and spend their hard earned money in a place that, you know, when they're expecting this tropical beach vacation and instead they're dealing with um, odorous, stinky 
algae on their beaches in terms of especially for these Caribbean regions that are really getting massive inundations. I mean, there's the entire governments are are looking at this as ways to try and find management um, solutions to deal with this. Um, this is one of their, from an environmental standpoint, this is one of the most pressing issues. So now if a person was swimming here by these buildings for whatever reason, and they came upon the this sargasm as they're swimming along, does it hurt them in any way? Is there any way this stuff is damaging to people? No, especially like this. So sargassum like this is completely non-toxic. Um, it's safe. Um, there's there's really no harm. So again, it's it's not toxic. It's not like some of the other harmful algal blooms that we hear of that are toxic, um, you know, that can give you rashes or if you eat something that you know, that is actually a toxin producing. This is just a physical impact where there have been threats of um, drowning and suffocation because it is so thick and so deep. So what can the average person do or should the average person do to uh, diminish the spread of these algals or algal blooms? This particular bloom is so large. I mean, it really is. You're talking about the Atlantic <laughs> Ocean, the indi an individual person really can't do anything to minimize their risk. I think what they can do is just educate themselves about it, recognize that if it's in small amounts, um, it's a good thing. It's, it is a benefit. Um, don't worry, it can't hurt you. If there's large amounts washed up on shore, there's no need to be recreating or spending time in that area. It does become a human health impact. It does release hydrogen sulfide when it starts to decay. It smells, it'll give you headaches. Just, you know, to the extent possible, remove yourself from a situation so that you don't have any risks of harm. And be safe if you are boating or recreating and you see this, just be safe. Know that it can get wrapped around a prop. You know, it can cause issues with your vessel. So just be irresponsible. <clears throat> now, it seems to me like props are strong enough to cut through this, but one of the dangers could be water-cooled engines could intake this stuff into the engine, and that's that would not be a good idea. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure yeah it can intake it. And there has been records of props getting tangled. and um, Okay, okay. Yeah. So, so it gets, it does get tough, stronger, more, has more tensile strength? Mm-hmm. Okay. So I mean, I think it's obviously going to depend on the size of the vessel that we're talking about. So anybody has questions can reach you at your email address. Thanks for shedding light on this interesting aquatic phenomenon. Oh, you're very welcome. Thanks again for having me. And I hope that some of the information was useful to you all as a yachting community and that it doesn't scare you away from visiting the Caribbean. Great. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you so much. presentation of the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon.